Most of us are stuck at home right now. And about 30% of us in the US are able to work from home, but many of us are doing it for the first time on a consistent basis. So I thought it might be interesting to share with you how I've been working from home for the past couple of years. It might give you some ideas and show you some of the tech and the gear that I use in my studio. Plus, I've got some home automation tricks that I use to make working from home just a little bit easier. I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to the Undecided Studio Tour. Before I started my own business and began working from home full time, I worked for a video game company that had a partial work from home policy. In theory, it was awesome being able to work from home, but it also was incredibly easy to get distracted. All of the stuff that we do to unwind away from work is all around us, taunting us. So I spent a good deal of time upgrading my home office to be more comfortable, more efficient, and trying to reduce those distractions. Then when I started my own freelance design business and dove into YouTube as well, I suddenly was home all of the time, which forced me to morph my home office once again. Now where I ended up took some time, but all of this helped me keep focused and productive. So let's start off by taking a look at my desk setup and why I ended up with what I did. My office is roughly a 10 foot by 10 foot room, so there's not a lot of space for huge desks and chairs. I had a lot of trouble finding a desk that fit the room, but still gave me the desk space that I needed but in the end, I ended up having a desk made, which isn't as expensive as it sounds. It's really just a tabletop cut to size and set on some custom metal legs. I then mounted a matching keyboard tray to keep the top clear, and I went with as much of a minimal approach as I could because it allows the desktop to morph depending on what I'm working on. So if I need room to sketch, lay out some paperwork, shoot some B-roll, or spread out with my graphics tablet or iPad, it's really easy to do so. I write most of my scripts, handle email, and do research on my iPad Pro, which gives me a lot of work flexibility in where I actually work. For a long time though, I used an iMac as my primary computer, and that meant that I was tethered to my desk for things like Photoshop and editing in Final Cut Pro. But at the end of last year, I switched over to a new 16-inch MacBook. Now being able to pick up shop and work from the kitchen table or my local library lets me mix things up no matter what task I'm doing. When I first switched to a laptop, I thought I might be able to get by with just the built-in 16-inch screen. And I was kidding myself. I should have known better because I've been doing this kind of work for a very long time. And me being me, I couldn't just get any old monitor to pair with the MacBook. So I got the Apple Pro Display, which you could argue is overkill for what I need right now, but it was calling my name. At the beginning of the year, I was able to get some pretty good discounts and pick one up. And yes, it was still very pricey, but for me, it was absolutely worth it. I have it mounted on an articulating arm from human scale. And I've been doing graphic design and photography work for decades, and the color reproduction on this is fantastic. It's the best monitor I've ever used. And since I spend a lot of time in Photoshop, Illustrator, Final Cut, and Adobe Audition, color reproduction and physical space is important for both. I'm able to work on a 4K video at full resolution and still have plenty of room for my timeline, files and transitions. And when working in programs like Photoshop, there's plenty of room for the actual thing that you're working on, since you don't lose as much space with all of the palettes opened. Having a large screen really does help with your productivity if you're having to jump around between apps a lot or working in UI constrained apps, like a nonlinear video editor. This is a monitor I will have for a very long time. As I've already mentioned, I've been doing UI and graphic design for a really long time, and as a result, I have repetitive stress injuries with my wrists and my right shoulder. It's too much time sitting in front of a computer for my job. Now, one of the things I found that helped was to use a graphics tablet most of the time. Holding a pen was more natural and comfortable than a mouse. However, with the work that I do, it's not always the best option. When I'm docked into the monitor, I use a Logitech keyboard and an MX Master mouse, and I regret not getting one of these mice sooner. Not only is it comfortable and has reduced some of the wrist pain, but it's made editing and Final Cut much faster with all the shortcuts and scroll wheels that it has. I also use a CalDigit Thunderbolt dock that I keep under my desk, which has a built-in SD card reader for transferring my videos and for connecting everything else into my Mac. For audio, I have a Motu M4 audio interface powering my iLoud MTM speakers. Now for the money, I think you'd have trouble finding better compact studio monitors. These things are killer. The Moto M4 not only has awesome audio quality, but it also has excellent preamps for clean audio input. I use it for my podcasting setup. 
And not too long ago, I picked up an Electro Voice RE320, which I'm really happy with so far. It's the baby brother to the RE20, which you see in a lot of professional studios. And while the RE320 is not exactly cheap, it's downright affordable compared to some of the other mics that you typically see streamers and professional podcasters using. Before this, I had a Shure Beta 87A, which is another great mic for podcasting. I have the RE320 mounted on a Blue Compass boom arm. I also have a couple of the Rode boom arms that you tend to see around, which you'll also see in a minute, but I prefer this one. It's more compact and self-contained and has built-in cable management. It also looks really clean. This makes it super easy to tuck the mic away when I'm not using it and to swing it out for use quickly. Having a workspace that can quickly morph with you depending on the task is important. The less friction that you have when you're switching between tasks means you'll be able to work faster and with less annoyance. As I mentioned already, I work in a super, super tiny room. So when I started creating YouTube videos and my office had to start pulling double duty as a studio, I needed to get a little creative with my camera and light setup. I actually constructed a bit of a strange camera rig. It's inspired by Caleb Pike over at DSLR Video Shooter. I have a couple of rolling light stands that have arm extensions and gobo clamps to hold my two main lights, microphone boom arm, camera, audio recorder, and monitor. It takes up much less floor space than it used to with multiple tripods and light stands. I can also wheel the whole setup around this way as a single unit. My main camera is a Sony a6400 with a G16 to 55 millimeter lens, which I usually keep at 24 millimeters for shooting my A-roll footage, like right now. I have that hooked into a Sound Devices Mix Pre 3 audio recorder, which is powering my Audio-Technica AT4053B. That's a little pro tip from me to any other YouTubers that are out there. Most people immediately think that they should get a shotgun microphone for shooting video, but shotguns may not be the best choice. For small rooms, shotgun mics can actually amplify the room reverb that they're picking up. So recording in a small, untreated space, you may struggle to get super clean recordings. This mic does a great job of rejecting a lot of the room reverb and noise in my space, even before I added a lot of soundproofing on my walls and my ceiling. I also have an Andy Cine A6 Plus monitor hooked into the camera to make it easier to see if I'm framed and lit properly. It's a nice monitor for a really cheap price. And for lighting, I'm using a Falcon Eyes SO68TD as my key light. You see a lot of YouTubers with huge lights and soft boxes, but something like that would take up half of my room. That's not an exaggeration. So LED light panels like this still give you great soft lighting without the bulk. I also have a Falcon Eyes RX18TD for a fill light, which is also great for travel. It can roll up and it's really easy for packing. Which brings me to my mood lighting that I use everywhere else in my studio. And I usually toss this. This is a Yongnyo YN360. I think that said that right. I'm never sure if I get that right. But I use this light as a spill light for my curtain that's behind me. I just usually just toss it on the ground behind me so it lights up the curtain. And then I have a bunch of Philips Hue lights hardwired into fixed positions for bias lighting behind me. There's three Hue plays behind my monitor and a bloom off to the side as well as a Hue light strip on the edge of my desk. And mounted on the edge of my desk, just out of frame, is my Elgato key light. This pulls double duty. I use it as an accent light from behind me, but also use it as a key light for my face if I'm doing streaming or Zoom calls. Now this is where my smart home comes in with my setup because I've automated a bunch of repetitive tasks for when I start and stop recording. I've created scenes for different looks in my background, like my blue look that you're seeing right now, or an orange and teal look. I can do whatever I want. Now with the push of a single button or calling out to my home pods, I can start my video recording activity. The ceiling lights and the speakers turn off, my Tetris light comes on along with my hue lights set to the default blue background lighting. And I'm not doing it these days because my wife is also working from home. But at one point I had my HVAC system put into a standby mode to reduce the fan noise coming from the floor vent. And when I'm done, I activate another scene, turn everything back off or put it back to normal lighting for when I'm sitting at the desk. There's also some other odds and ends that I have with my gear, like some sliders for getting really smooth and polished tracking shots, or action cameras, 360 degree cameras, different tripods and mounts for shooting in something like a car. I also have a secondary A6600 camera and lots of lenses. But I'd like to leave you with a few tips that go beyond the specific gear. It's more about the why of all of this. No matter what it is that you do, you're going to find repetitive tasks that just soak up your time. In my case, with my video production, it was irritating and time consuming when I'd have to tear down my tripod, camera, and lights if I needed to get some B-roll footage somewhere else, only to have to come back in here to set it all back up again the way it was originally. 
and I could never get it quite right. Getting secondary video production gear like a camera for the studio and another for shooting elsewhere really smoothed out a rough edge of my production. Saving a few minutes here and there not only adds up over time, but it helps to reduce the dread of doing a task. If you dread something, you're going to find every conceivable reason not to do that thing, which leads me to routines. You need to trick your brain into getting you into your work mode. And one of the best ways to do that is with routines. Make sure you always follow the same routine for your work day. It's the current joke that people aren't wearing pants on their Zoom calls, or they're drinking beer at two o'clock in the afternoon. Don't do that. Get up, get dressed, albeit more casually dressed, every single day to kick off your work day. Treat it like you would if you had to go into the office. Your office just happens to be your den or your kitchen, wherever you carved out space. And whatever space that is, try to use a space that isn't used for relaxation and fun. The only thing I do in my home office is work, so I'm not fighting off an urge to watch a TV show or play a video game. If you have to work in a cross-functional space, try sitting in it in a different way. Like don't sit in your usual spot at the dinner table. Sit on the opposite side that you're used to for work. What? It sounds silly, but it can sometimes be just enough of a little subconscious trick to help keep you focused. I've gotten into these habits and managed to carve out workspaces that keep me focused and let me work fluidly by getting out of my way. Now jump into the comments and let me know how your work from home has been going, or if you have any questions about the gear I've been using. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.